Hey everybody, welcome back to the Insights Podcast presented by Vantage Pro. I am Duke, all the way on the other side. See, I didn't forget. It's been a little while. We've been on a, uh, a slight break and uh, all the way on the other side, Mr. Van Metschke. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that handsome gentleman in the middle, one of our uh, one of our favorite people, actually, I think, in the industry. Uh, yeah, no, it's your big head. Uh, <laughs> talking to you, talking to you. <laughs> one, of our, one of our favorite people in the industry. We always uh, try to hunt him down at trade shows. Mister Chris Neiman from the wonderful world of Sure. Sure. Hello, hello, hello. What is your title these days? Oh, uh, it, it, yeah, you know, it's changed a lot lately in the last several years, but uh, we're currently up to market development manager in the central and western U.S. Okay. All right. I like it. Our team mainly focuses on end users, whether it's in enterprise, house of worship, uh, you know, uh, what we call events and content, which could be anything from making podcasts to a worship service. Right. Yeah. No, oh, very cool. Well, we're, we're excited to have you just, I mean, mostly just for us, we're excited to have you, but I think, <laughs> yeah, I know. seems like we I haven't talked I... in a very long time. Hey, it's Van. I just wanted to jump in here real quick and ask you if you like this kind of content to please like, and subscribe, share this with a friend and comment below. We love hearing your comments and we really do read all of them. So comment below, like, and subscribe. And now back to the podcast. I feel the same. It's like, I've missed you guys at the last couple of shows. I've been busy tied up doing stuff. So I guess we have to get together on a podcast once in a while to, to at least say we've seen each other in a year. <laughs> For sure. For sure. <laughs> Well, we've uh, we've got kind of a fun topic. I have I have this sneaking suspicion we're going to run into multiple episodes, but uh, the uh, the wireless landscape is changing dramatically, and so we're we're excited to have you on. I don't know that a lot of people have been following it because it's uh, you know in the world of of everything that's going on right now, uh, <laughs> this is probably a smaller topic. Um, but uh, over the last what year or so there's been this kind of ramp up of information and activity around a completely new wireless technology. And, and you're going to educate us on that today. Yeah, I'll give you, um, I, it, this is a, such a great conversation to have because um, like you say, uh, we've gone through a couple different auctions now and those auctions have netted the government billions and billions of dollars and um yeah, they're doing they well, for like, uh, well yeah i mean there's i guess you can <laughs> question you know how, how do you auction off an intangible uh, the airspace but they're doing it and uh people are paying for it but when every time that happens we lose some space that we lose some of our beachfront property in that uhf spectrum so um, there's some cool new things going on. We've been partitioning the, uh, petitioning or partitioning, petitioning, uh, the FCC for along with some other manufacturers. And so check this out. Um, I'm going to share some details with you on this presentation. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, there's a new kind of set of, of standards that the FCC has adopted, uh, with the help of sure and some other, uh, microphone manufacturers called W mass. And uh, I think it'd be good to kind of explain a little bit about this uh, and yeah. what it actually is, what it means. And so um, I'll go through some of this, a little bit about a re regulatory affairs team, do an introduction. We have a vision for W mass and how it could be deployed. Um, what kind of regulations maybe and some other key takeaways here, but let's, let's get to where the rubber hits the road. Like I mentioned, we've been through several uh, auctions. The one back in 2017 netted almost 20 billion with a B. And then in 2021, 81 billion, that's again with a B. Basically from 1997 till today, we have lost 58% of our UHF beachfront you know, property spectrum. This UHF is 
a great place for microphones to live, wireless mics, because the antennas are manageable. They're not huge. They're not too small. The wavelength propagation really works well. But that's the same reason everybody else wants to use that spectrum. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, you know, the old days, it was just television stations and us. Now it's TV stations, wireless microphones, and other companies like T-Mobile, Dish, Comcast. They're buying Spectrum, Verizon, AT&T. So what about the future? What about, you know, looking forward to the future? Well, there's this guy some people know about named Elon Musk, and he's trying to deploy all kinds of communications through satellite or whatever he's working on. And there's a battle again over spectrum between a different group of people, not just the comm devices like uh, uh, Verizon, AT and T, T-Mobile, but literally now we're talking about Bezos and Dell, uh, um, so and Elon Musk. So, and at last I checked, I think those guys have just about all the money in the world. So it's going to be really interesting to see <laughs> kind of where we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh, as we move forward here, it's also important to note that today spectrum, you know, we, we've lost spectrum, but the TV channels that are available over the air, the old fashioned type where you just set up an, an antenna and you pick up a t television station over the air, those things still exist. So um, this illustration here, you might notice these little black chunks. We actually call those white spaces. They're the space in between TV channels where wireless microphones can operate and have operated. But after all of the current uh, uh, sell-offs of Spectrum, those DTV stations got repacked into a smaller chunk of Spectrum, leaving us even less space to operate in. And... Um, so, I mean, this is interesting. Phoenix, Arizona is one of the worst places. Uh, only two open television channels. And by the way, a television channel, channel is six megahertz wide. And we need to kind of operate within those chunks or those blocks that's already been predetermined by the FCC. So, um, yeah, we, that's kind we, of... Uh, we regularly feel the pain of that Los Angeles and Pasadena. Every time we work with a church, like the closer we get to Los Angeles, the more we go, yeah, buy the really good wireless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the truth. And Pasadena, you could be sitting right down below Mount Wilson there, and you're just getting blown away by high power television stations all over the place. Los Angeles, you can almost see into both valleys, um, and that's you're even worse there. By the way, Los Angeles, also, you're supposed to kind of observe the fact that there should be some uh, life safety channels reserved uh, in that space. So technically, uh, some of the space also is not truly available down below like channel i think it's channel 14 and 16 maybe um, i have to go back and look at my notes but but yeah um so what sure does is we have a regulatory team all across the globe because it doesn't make that much sense to just try to make something work in the us right um we want to sell our product everywhere and we know we have folks that use our products all across the globe so we really try to stay in touch with what regulations are happening everywhere. And of note, it's kind of interesting to, to point out that um, this W mass spectrum um, has already been ratified in uh, Europe. And then we just recently ratified it at the FCC here in the US. So that covers a great majority of kind of where this thing comes into play, where this ability to use this specification comes into play. Um, I bet you that department's uh, Christmas party is a whole lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know what? No, I don't. I don't want to imagine what that thing's like. No. Um, the old days, the Vagamon system, this one cracks me up. This was the Shure's first wireless system way, 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 way back when. It's kind of funny. It, the transmitter uh, was huge. It had vacuum tubes in it. It would get too hot to hold. And it had an antenna that was about six foot in radius that if you stepped outside of the antenna that was laying on the floor, it would stop working. But <laughs> it was an analog system. And that took us all the way up kind of to around the first 
sale of spectrum when manufacturers, wireless manufacturers started to go, gosh, we have to do something to become more spectrally efficient. And so that kind of brought us into the digital age. Um, and we would typically call that digital narrowband uh, type of things because analog, of course, requires a, uh, it actually uses the analog audio signal to modulate the RF signal. And you're always been limited to how wide you can have that modulation. It's 200 kilohertz. You can't have it any wider than that. And what digital did is it brought that, that um, the ability to bring a lot more channels closer together um, and it was much more spectrally efficient. I think everyone probably realized that anyone that used the old ULX analog or old SLX platform that was analog or even UHFR, you were limited to a handful of channels within a six megahertz mm -hmm. chunk. Moving into digital, we're up to, you know, 14 to 17 systems in that single six megahertz chunk. Moving forward, WMAS is a wide band technology. This is an important differentiation between everything else we've talked about. Wide band means we're gonna take up more spectrum, but within that wider chunk, we're actually gonna get more channels on the air in that, in that uh, wider chunk. So first of all, like what is WMAS? Well, it stands for Wireless Multi-Channel Audio System. And it's a technology neutral approach. Like I said, it's a, it's a set of kind of specifications that you have to meet to be able to, uh, to operate in a WMAS type of situation. Every manufacturer is gonna have a different technology that they come up with that meets that spec. In this scenario, you could have things like maybe comm systems uh, where it's bi-directional. Uh, you have two-way talk. You have a control link as well over WMAS. They could be one way, like a body pack transmitter that communicates directly in one direction. However, it would also have a management or control link channel. Same thing with maybe some handhelds. Or it goes the other way with some, maybe some personal inner monitoring where it's a transmitter, again, one way, but with a communications link. I think there's a there's a, a kind of a cool application here potentially also for conferencing units where maybe again you need that bi-directional kind of audio uh, there also again with a control link and so for a lot of our customers we know that this could unlock a great deal of innovation and um, potential for future applications and how they use it it does allow for a much more efficient use of the spectrum and it le leverages the scalable architecture. So if you really need to have a lot of channels, you know, come online quickly in a space, this is a great uh, um, application to use WMAS. And like I mentioned already, it's already harmonized with European standards. If I didn't mention already, um, in the US, the FCC has ratified it, but we're still waiting for the ink to dry from legislators. So we expect that to be somewhere the end of this year maybe beginning of next year for it to be officially official official so okay. um, yeah where did it start european telecommunication standard the etsy Qu and, question for you before yeah. you get too much further though i mean what i saw was both input devices and output devices and one little thing in the middle right now when we when we do input devices that's one set of receivers that's one set of antenna that's one set of antenna distribution. And then when we do our in-ears and all that stuff, we're talking about a whole different set of transmitters, different sets of antennas. What this picture is leading me to believe is that goes away. We literally, one wireless system is one wireless system. It could be, uh, it could be. The, okay. um, the specification that's, that's actually kind of interesting here is that it has to use at least uh, three, where is it here? It's got to use at least three wireless channels per gigahertz. Okay. Three wireless channels. Per, it, it could be one way. It could be bi-directional or it could be the other way, but it has to be at least three channels per gigahertz. Now, um, we find that that's... Um, uh, that's fairly easily to easy to achieve. Uh, we're excited about that. That's not a, that's not really a, 
a, a hard thing necessarily to get to. Um, but uh, our so real quick, you know, our vision again for WMass is going to be a little bit different. I think what you see us um, what you see us hitting the streets with. Um, we want to be more efficient use of the spectrum as well. Here's that deal again. I said it's got to be at least three audio channels per megahertz of bandwidth required. But what we're talking about is if I had four different carriers, and let's pretend this is analog for now. That's fine. We can say this is an analog system. We have to be very concerned with coordination because these little red things indicate intermods. Uh, for those of you who have suffered through this accidentally and found out, oh, I've got to pay attention to this, these little <laughs> red things can really interfere with you and, and give you a hard time uh, knocking your wireless systems offline or making them even unusable. Yeah. So coordinating channels has always been very important. When digital uh, uh, transmission schemes came around, the intermods are still there. They're just lower to the noise floor. So you still have to coordinate planning to, to uh, transmit around these intermods. So you, again, you're not stepping on yourself and causing yourself problems. When we go to this wideband, digital wideband, essentially uh, those carriers are gonna kind of be scrunched together. And this is going to allow us to have multiple carriers uh, and, and each one will have a different slot on each carrier. Each user could be a different slot on the carrier. So again, if I further illustrate some of this, um, here's an example with a six megahertz gap uh, with a total amount of like legacy narrowband devices there. Uh, you could also get maybe three, but we're dreaming here, right? Where this is, these are possibilities of what could happen, an example. We could have a mixed use. You could have some narrowband stuff. Maybe you take up three megahertz of WMAS for 15 audio channels because per carrier, we're going to actually be able to carry uh, five uh, audio signals per carrier. So that's where this comes from. Three megahertz, 15 channels of audio in a wide thing, uh, um, a, a wide transmission scheme. What if we use the entire six megahertz gap? Remember, six megahertz is the TV channel. Right. I could get maybe 30 channels of audio. And there's some qualifications here, depending upon how different manufacturers de decide to deploy their technology. Um, it, some manufacturers may offer less channels. Some may offer more channels. But in the wide band, the, the, the WMAS um, configuration, Remember, it has to meet at least three audio channels per megahertz. So this is important to kind of kind of think through here. Um, here's an example with two megahertz gap, uh, utilizing 10 audio channels total. So at the end of the day, like, you know, will WMAS replace narrowband? I don't think so, because I'm not I'm not sure how many house of worship markets or, you know, event uh, event spaces are going to need, um, for instance, 30 channels of bi-directional audio in a six megahertz chunk. What right. they may need is, you know, uh, four or 10 channels of transmits and the same amount in, in ears. So a much reduced amount, and maybe we don't wanna use the entire spec six megahertz chunk to deploy that kind of thing. So we believe that narrowband standard digital technology. What I'm talking about is QLXD, SLXD, ULXD, Axiant Digital, the way those operate today, we don't see that going anywhere anytime soon. Sure. Um, uh, so yeah. And then also, this is kind of a, an operational note here, co-channel, co-located co operation of WMAS with narrowband possible. No. Uh, so for those of you that are really tweaking out and geeking out, <laughs> this section is it's you you know you can operate side by side but not on channel uh, with the other stuff so um kind of round the corner here a little bit um so essentially w, w mass is really targeting either high high capacity users uh or those who are 
moderate capacity, but are basically landlocked in, in yeah. spectrum. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and and currently we're to only talking about uh, the UHF TV band. Um, there is a possibility somewhere in the future we may be able to use the AFTRAC band, which is up in the 1.6 uh, gig, I believe it is, area 1.4. Um, that's a aeronautical, uh, you know, land to, to plane communication uh, type of control link that's used for testing airplanes. Uh, and so that's not always in use and it's not all across the US, it's only in certain places. So anyway, put a pin in that. What's available today is UHF. There, We are looking to see if we can deploy WMAS into other frequency bands at some point as well. Uh, but yeah. that's kind of what this is calling out here. Um, you can be a licensed user and operate WMAS. There's a max output power associated with all of this. Most users of wireless microphones are unlicensed. And so in this case, there'll be a max output power, um, again, also associated here, 100 milliwatt for bandwidths greater than one megahertz, up to six megahertz, 50 milliwatts for one megahertz bandwidth. This is all a bunch of fun details that um, we're gonna continue to learn more about, I think, over time. And, and as, you, as we look at deployments, because there's a lot of different potential variables here. Um, I think that it's going to be a great addition um, and we're going to look to, like I've already said, we're going to look to continue to offer technology that is uh, compatible today as well as into the future with other things like WMAS. And so FCC does permit both licensed and unlicensed there. Um, yeah, this is a bunch of other <laughs> basic stuff here. So in summary, it's a technology neutral approach for multi-channel op audio applications. There's not one WMAS technology, but it's a standard that defines that transmission. We support the scalable and spectrally efficient double WMAS, and it is regulated and allowed in the US and Europe already. And we're working with Mexico, Canada, Australia, uh, and the United Arab Emirates. Hmm. So that's kind of a, a high level overview of WMAS. Um, are there any thoughts or questions there? I mean, the, the thing that I think about most is like, it is a cool new, um, opportunity for us to learn and, and deploy wireless systems and it's coming and we should know about it. But if you're a house of worship that operates 20 channels of wireless in the sanctuary with 20 channels of, or excuse me, maybe 10 channels of ears. I'm not sure that you would use WMAS. Um, it may be it may be something to consider. Yeah, I think like, part of it's going to depend on where you are, right? If you're if you're in a in a major metro area, Los Angeles, Chicago, um, you know, some of these larger cities where RF is already so tight. We I know we dealt with this. Uh, we had a project in uh, uh, Glendora, so just right outside of the kind of the Pasadena area, right? And it. I think we ended up with like 12 channels of wireless mic and then they wanted, um, I think it was like eight or 10 channels of stereo in-ears. And just based on TV channels alone, we basically went, yeah, you can have eight. You can't have 10 in-ears. Like there's no room. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think some of these larger cities, larger areas, when you start even getting into, you know, uh, uh, the mega church setting, right? The, the, we've got a larger stage, larger band. We're going to need, you know, 12 channels, 16 channels of wireless plus, uh, you know, uh, eight to 12 in-ears. It's starting to get hard. Um, even with some of the, the narrow band stuff that you guys are doing or, or other people are doing, but like even with Axiant, you still run out of space at some point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you run out of space and they're just not making any more of it, are they? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Yeah. And, no, and, and so on that note, we continue to look at other chunks of spectrum. It's probably worth mentioning. Um, we get this question all the time. Why don't, why don't you just mics that work? Excuse me. Why don't you just make mics that work somewhere else? And the reality is the entire U, the entire RF spectrum, the radio frequency spectrum, all of it is already allocated for something. 
So right. uh, we have to learn how to either coexist with other, you know, technologies or other uses of the spectrum that are happening somewhere else. Um, or what we have done historically is fought to try to defend that UHF spectrum because, like I've said, that's beachfront property. But um, but this forces everyone to become more um, innovative, really. You know, all of us wireless microphone manufacturers have to become more innovative in order to, to bring new products that are relevant to people who want wireless uh, to work and it to work well. So the, the well, WMAS thing is cool because, by the way, you no longer really have to coordinate frequencies, right? That base right. station in that picture that I had showed, that's coordinating everything. Like you just say you, you need to park your chunk uh, somewhere in an open space and it does all the rest of the coordination, everything. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. No, I think I think that's one of the more interesting aspects of this whole thing, especially in, uh, again, those, those major major metro markets is if you can if you can find this chunk and go i need 30 channels of audio in any direction um it just sort of manages all that for you i mean it's again one set of antennas one set of distribution one set of everything and all of a sudden now we're in business and that's yeah. To me, that's where it starts getting really cool, really interesting, really efficient, not just from an RF perspective, but even you start talking about racks, you start talking about the number of antennas you have to buy, you start talking about the number of distros you have to buy, uh, all these kinds of different things. Um, like, I just, I love the efficiency of all of it. Um, and knowing that it's still in UHF, I have a high confidence that it's going to work as opposed to you know, a 2.4 gigahertz solution, which I feel like never, never really worked well. <laughs> and there's a market. number of reasons why it's, it's a crowded space. Right. And, um, and you're, you're fighting with, with other things that are, that are happening there. So yeah, at least, at least in the UHF TV spectrum, like today, um, TV stations don't jump around. They're on air and that's where they are. And you can dance around them and, and, and uh, your environment doesn't really change unless somebody brings a new wireless system in. That's the only thing that would make something change typically. So again, yeah, all these other spaces are much more dynamic and um, we'll see. We'll see where technology leads us into working and cooperating in those other spaces. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's cool. We've come a long way from. Uh, I was just reading an article. You know, you go back to what was the shirt stuff called? The the very beginning. What was that called? Vagabond. Vagabond. Yeah. Yeah. I was just reading a whole article about how they did. Um, I can't remember what the. Uh, I think it was singing in the rain, and the, so for a lot of the stuff, they literally had the antenna was on the floor underneath the plywood, like the actors had to stay in the. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was really crazy how it how it worked. In fact, it's kind of funny. Um, one of the innovators at Shure, Benjamin Bauer, uh, he he eventually was running our entire engineering department. The guy that's responsible for what is now the SM58, and frankly, any uh, dynamic directional microphone is needs to be related. Uh, you know, giving credit back to Ben about uh, all of his work that he did. He wrote a memo internally uh, to Mr. Shure stating like, I know that forces are wanting us something around this, like I, I, forces are wanting us to do wireless stuff, but I highly recommend we do not because it's volatile and it's up to the US government to decide how that space is used. So even way back then, before the vagabond, there was doubt and worry about, can we do this? You know, is it going to be reliable? Uh, so fortunately, I think we made it. It's still very highly dependent on the government. So that part was, was dead on. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially since, you know, when we went through all the first, uh, well, what was the first, what was the first uh, one to be cut? Was that 700 megahertz? Is that what it was? Yep. Eight, well, 800 megahertz, yeah. Eight, 800 megahertz. Um, I just remember watching all the congressional hearings and, and, and stuff and just seeing how little limit, what the limited knowledge of our lawmakers was about how wireless works. 
And I'll never forget that one where the person was talking about how nobody really uses that technology when they're, and they were holding right. a wireless microphone. Part, you know. part of what that group does, our FCC folks that, that all around the globe is, and, and specifically here in the U.S., I should say, is lawmakers are what? They're elected and they change all the time. And people that they put in place are appointed, right? So it's not like there's, you know, wireless mic experts that are always around. Uh, part of what we do as manufacturers try is constantly trying to re-educate everyone um, on uh, on the importance of it. And, and to your point, Van, it is kind of funny where usually what happens is they go, really, wireless mics? Do we really need that? And then you show a picture of them holding one running for office and you go, Oh yeah. Okay. We do need that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, well, there's, there's really an cool stuff. I'm excited to see how it's going to get implemented and how we're going to be able to do that when it gets into the main marketplace, yeah. um, in mass, uh, yeah. not to, that was not a pun. Uh, it would be <laughs> interesting to, to see how that's actually going to make our lives easier, make our lives better. And, ultimately make yeah. our customers lives better and, yeah. and, you know, for, for just doing events, but live events well, I, are never going away and we're going to have to use, we have to keep honing our technology to make them better. Well, I, I imagine there's huge implications for both the touring market and for Broadway in particular, but I think even as a lot of our churches get more and more dependent on wireless. And of course it's, I mean, I, the, the thing I always communicate with, with pastors is like wireless leads probably 95% of your service, maybe, maybe even more, right? It's, it's the dude up there with a headset or a talking head and just, you know, communicating the message. And then it's a worship leader who, even though oftentimes they're glued to an instrument, still have a wireless mic, right? So it's like, if you're going to be leading 95% of your, that better be the best piece of gear you own. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, um, I'm just glad that we don't. Have, I, I remember when this the, all this first started. This 800 megahertz, 700 megahertz. I mean, we were just talking about okay. Well, how few wirelesses can we use on the stage? Like, who can be corded? You know, who can actually have a? I mean, as tech directors, you know, we, I I was a tech director at the time. We were having serious discussions about it. Like, I'm trying. To, yeah. I'm like, okay, we can't. Uh, let's. I would love to have ten wireless microphones, but we can we can get along with four. You know, and everything else can be, everything else can be connected. You know, it was, it was a weird, like, are we going to, are we actually going to regress now? Have we gone too far now? We have to go back to what's the reliable thing. So mm -hmm. yeah. it was, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey the last 15 years, especially. Yeah. Yeah. There was a uh, hundred billion dollars. So I, it's, I need to, I need to write a letter. <laughs> There's a there's a funny uh, saying that used to bounce around the halls of Shure. Uh, this was clear back to like the first auction, and it was the future of wireless is wired. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, I know. I know. We'll often have that conversation with with church, but there's there's this whole like, well, yeah, but we got to clear the stage. We got to do this. We got to do that. And it's like, okay. I mean, as long as you have good reasons, like you like. Yeah legitimate reasons why if you're just going wireless because you think it's better I don't, I don't know if it is yeah i um i'll never forget like conversations that i'll have with you know a, a bass player for instance that doesn't have the money for axiom digital which is probably where you want to be if you're a bass player going wireless you know maybe right. at ulxd but they'll buy a, an inexpensive analog system and stand two feet away from their base amp or cabinet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, you realize this does not sound as good. I mean, it right. doesn't matter. You pick the manufacturer. I'll beat up sure. You plug into a BLX wireless system analog and your base is just not going to sound as good as a good old wire plugged directly in. And uh, unless you're dancing around, you know, yeah. I'm not well, sure if you need it. I, I always like to pull open the specs when I get those pokes because there's a lot of weird, like it, whether it's sure or anybody else, there's a lot of weird, like little tiny wireless things that people are buying off of Amazon this day too. Yeah. And I'll pull open the specs and it's like, Hey, do you see where this says it only transmits down to 80 Hertz? You're a bass guitar. 
you know those low frequencies that actually hit the subs? Do you want those? <laughs> Don't use this. Yeah. Bad idea. Yeah. Well, I still think it's a good, it's a good, you know, I mean, not everybody in our company, I, I, th I don't know if we're all on the same page on this, but when I talked to people, I was just like, look, if you can be wired, if you never move, there's no reason for the drummer IMs to be on on a wireless. That's, that's dumb. It you're wasting that. And that's expensive. That's an expensive. Yeah. That's expensive way. And the guy's literally does not move. He literally sits at the exactly the same place or a keyboard player or, or even a bass guitar or a guitar player. Most of those people are pretty set on the stage, especially in yeah. church. There are people that move around if they're a lead, if they're leads a hundred percent, absolutely. That makes sense. But why would I want the grief of, of having to uh, manage all that stuff, no matter how good or bad the wireless is, why would you want the yeah. grief it's, from a production it's standpoint? One it's one reason. Well, because that one time I tried to walk off the stage without unplugging and I knocked yeah. everything over. Well, that's, all, that's the one reason that's more of a, <laughs> that's more of a execution uh, issue than it is a, <laughs> a yeah, technology issue. Well, that's a training topic. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. Uh, well, we, we, I, I, there's a lot more to talk about on this, but we're, we're really about out of time. Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll hold you over and we'll, we'll do another episode, but we want to get into the product side of this dream a little bit. Um, I know there's things you probably can and can't tell us of what is real, but, uh, you're also a smart guy. And I know that, that you've got some, uh, probably some, uh, foresight of what might be possible five years, 10 years down the road too. So, uh, we want to get into the real and the ethereal on W mass. Um, but is there, um, do you guys have more resources available? If people want to go check out more, um, it, where, where can they find more info on this stuff? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You can go to Shure's website, um, Shure.com. And uh, there, we have done a webinar on this. Uh, there's also a great article that um, uh, Ben Escobedo has written. Um, ben is uh, one of our great uh, market dev folks that's out there. Um, and he's, he's a real guru, man. He's, he's really great. He's on the East Coast, by the way. Um, but he has really written a, uh, a really good, in-depth, clean, clear article uh, that helps express all this stuff. That's also available on sure.com. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll put those in the show notes, uh, so that people can just click right on yeah. and go to them. So, but yeah, if you're, if you're somebody who's using a lot of wireless channels, um, uh, inputs or outputs, um, this is something that should very much be on your radar. You should be paying attention to what's happening, what's coming down the pike. Cause it, I, th I do think this is probably one of going to be one of the biggest innovations in RF in a long time, really. Yeah, yeah, these kind of announcements and these products only come around every once in a great while. Um, you know, takes me back to like launching Axiant Analog. Um, right. That was yeah. a big deal uh, back then. And now it's just, yeah. I think people kind of expect those kind of features and stuff out of a wireless system. So, yeah. Uh, right. For 800 bucks a channel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Uh, sorry, that was just a little poke. Well, uh, Chris, we're, we're, we're excited to talk to you as always. And this is, like I said, I think this is a big deal. I think a lot of people don't realize how my, my gut on this is going to be that it's going to impact how we use RF in a significant way in the years to come. And so I'm, I'm excited to see more, but, uh, uh, yeah, hang out with us. We, we want to, uh, we want to get into the product side too and dream a little. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, sounds good. For those of you listening, uh, we'll we'll have we'll have all of those uh, notes below. Um, but if you're listening, watching all the things, uh, make sure you like, subscribe. Um, you can send us a letter if you really want, but but mostly Carrier like pigeon, some, whatever. Carrier pigeon, yeah, yeah. If you've got one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we appreciate you uh, hanging in with us and 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 learning new stuff. This was this was like a heavy info episode, but I like I said, I think it's going to be. Um, really a game changer to for years to come so yeah sure. uh, join us join us next episode we're going to talk about the product side of this and see where it gets really fun so yeah see you with that thanks for thanks for watching thanks for listening we'll catch you next one a little musical outro there <laughs>